and start. Um, welcome to Ed Cable Talk. Um, as we say in our, uh, in our uh, byline, there are hot topics dished up fresh. And uh, it's been uh, easy to keep those topics fresh as it's been pretty cold all over the country. And um, I, I, I really think this is a great topic for discussion. Our topic today is uh, making assessment actionable with the, with the extra subtitle of um, don't tell us that we're doing poorly. Tell us how we can um, improve uh, education. So um, that's going to be the topic of discussion today. This is the first uh, Ed Table Talk of 2014, as many of you probably know. Uh, for those of you who have never tuned into the show before or listened to it online, uh, there uh, we've had a number of very good shows uh, starting back in September um, where we talked about uh, really less expensive to produce and distribute digital resources. Um, in October, and we had uh, a number of really good people, Jeff Fletcher, Karen uh, Coe, Kathy Zier on that show. In October, we talked about we preparing our teachers for the students of yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And again, had Karen Pater, Alvin Crawford, and uh, James Welsh um, on that show. And then just back in November, um, we had, are we doing the best to prepare all children to realize their potential? And uh, we had Suzanne tu Tuvenel, and we had Jennifer Moore and Rita Poe. Um, who are on that. So this is our uh, fourth show, and uh, it's really great to have um, all of you, um, all of you here. Um, as a as a quick introduction, you know, I try to always sort of give my perspective about this topic. Um, you know, number one, let me first thank our sponsor, um, and that's MCH uh, Strategic Data, and thank them for all of their support. They um, help us not just in um, putting the show together, but also marketing and really discussing a number of the interesting points. They're a pleasure to work with. And um, I really uh, I really think there's an opportunity um, uh, for everybody to work with them. I think they're just a great group to work with, and I do recommend them highly. So um, let's go into uh, the topic for today. And again, making assessment actionable is key. I know you know, having both been a teacher as well as a student, um, you know, the, the nature of assessment is uh, is really challenging. And what role does assessment actually play? I think, you know, historically, we've all had to take tests. I mean, I certainly remember um, colleagues giving a test every Friday, whether it was needed or not, um, as a testing point. Um, I know that I used always rather interesting strategies in my classroom. and. Um, from a formative perspective uh, and uh, really gave kids a chance to really discuss topics and collect the data along the way. But the trick there is always how do you, uh, you know, is it quantify it or how do you qualify it? How do you uh, capture that information so that um, it can be used to give concrete examples of, of student learning? And, and the tendency is to, to fall back to, a numerical score, and we know that those often get misused and abused um, and are, are hard to interpret. Uh, to that end, I, I'll, I'll fully admit that I am a banana slum. And um, by that, I mean that I was did my undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz. And um, that was a real changing experience for me um, when it comes to particularly looking at assessment. When I went to Santa Cruz, there were no grades. It was all narrative assessments. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, it seems flaky when some people think about that. But I can tell you, getting two or three or four paragraphs, particularly when you get out of your larger undergraduate courses, is just amazing in terms of really getting information back about who you are as a learner. I remember when I went off to graduate school and I would get an A in a course and I'd say, what does that mean? What, is, what does the A mean to me? How did I do? Where was I strong? Where was I weak? Um, you know, it, it, it's when you change the nature of how you assess, when you rechange the nature of, of how learning takes place. And I think that's an important part of our, of our discussion today is, is the impact of assessment on how we teach and how do we make that assessment actionable. I think a lot of the conversation is also around actions being taken by the teacher. I think it's also important that we think about actions as the student is an active participant in their learning and not just looking for the grade, but in fact looking to improve and really taking ownership um, over their learning. So I think this is a, a really good topic in this day and age, particularly given high stakes assessments. 
um, and all the brouhaha around those assessments and time spent being tested, uh, I think that uh, we as, a, as a, an electorate um, who uh, are active hopefully in, in selecting our board members or being involved in our schools have a clear understanding and expectations around what uh, state standards, uh, common core standards bring, as well as what the high stakes assessments bring and the role of formative assessment in actually supporting learning. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our, uh, our guests. We have a great set of guests for today's uh, program. First, uh, and you can see Kathy's beautiful image up there, Kathy Dyer, who is a senior curriculum specialist. No chortling over that at all. Um, <laughs> Northwest at the uh, NWEA, Northwest Evaluation Association. Many of you may be aware of that organization because I remember really engaging assessments that they do provide and, and uh, good quality. But also, I know Kathy is directly related with, involved with formative assessment. Kathy, you can just say a little bit about, about what you do, who you are, and, and why this topic is of interest to you. Sure, that'd be great. Thanks, Michael. I'm glad to be here today. You know, NWA is a not-for-profit, and where our mission is partnering to help all kids learn, which means that being student-centric is kind of core to our DNA. We're all about providing data and professional development that helps make data actionable. For me, assessment works best when it's used to help students learn and teachers improve their practice, and that is the action that's in the word actionable. I think that formative assessment is just the way to go. This is something I've been working on for the last decade or more, and it's a topic that I do like to talk about, so you'll probably have to rate me in a little bit today. But I do have to ask a rhetorical question, since I am coming from the outskirts of Denver. Did you notice how Peyton Manning used his formative assessment yesterday? I have to say, I know nothing about football. <laughs> But others on this call must understand that. <laughs> but we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll come back to that point, Kathy. Okay. Actually, I'm proud that I knew it was football. By the way. Uh, that is good. That is good. Okay. My producer Tila here is frenzied. So, with that said, let's go to Brian um, or Celine next. Brian is next. Um, Brian Rick. Brian is uh, research and assessment director at uh, the Bellingham Public School District, which happens to be where my organization, Educational Systemic, is located. I've gotten to know Brian over the last several years, um, and I really have just uh, a lot of respect for him and his thoughtfulness around assessment. We're so lucky at the Bellingham School to have uh, Brian and uh, here to work with the educators and parents and teachers and staff. So, Brian, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and why this topic is of interest to you. Oh, you're very kind, Michael. Um, yeah, I have been in education for over 20 years. Um, I started out as a secondary math teacher and got drawn into work with state assessments and professional development um, through that time. And with my role, I stay current uh, serving on state technical advisory and uh, network of assessment directors. But the, the best thing about my job is I get to work alongside K-12 teachers and principals and administrators every day to help develop their understanding and use of data. And that's why this, um, this session is really important to me, selfishly, uh, because I want to learn more. I want to share about this really important topic because I think we need better tools out there. And um, these conversations are just a sort, sort of way to make that happen. Yeah, that's, um, again, it shows in all the work that you do here at the district, so I appreciate that. Um, and lastly, um, we have uh, Helene Duvin. Um, I wanted to say Duvin, but uh, apparently that's not her uh, background. So Duvin, um, and uh, Helene is uh, Director of Education and Assessment Solutions at Pacific Metrics. Um, I've only gotten to know Helene just recently, but in fact, I've been really impressed with the kind of work that she's doing. So, Helene, maybe you can share some of that with our with our listeners. Um, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, allowing me to participate in this conversation. Um, so, just a little background on me. Um, I, um, as Jay said, I'm Director of Education Assessment Solutions at Pacific Metrics. 
and Pacific Metrics is an innovative company offering technology-based assessment solutions. Um, even though Jay and I haven't, haven't really met before, I've been involved in this industry for over 25 years um, with experience from both ETS and Pearson. Um, I have a real passion for improving education and personalizing, personalizing that education experience for students. Um, and I think technology is one way to engage students. Um, I think about my 16-year-old nephews who grew up with, you know, a PlayStation in one hand and a Nintendo in another, and when they go to school, they're just not um, um, offer that same level of engagement. So I'm really excited about the opportunities in our industry to really uh, push the envelope when it comes to learning um, and assessment. Certainly in our pre-call, Helene, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this. So. Thank you so much, and thank you for all three of you for being guests. Again, a reminder, um, if you want to uh, tweet about this program, you can go to, uh, you can tweet the hashtag E-T-T-J-A-N, E-T-T January, um, uh, if you want to discuss it with others. So now we're going to move to our favorite segment, which is You Can't Handle the Truth. Um, for those of you who have not listened before, um, we uh, have uh, – uh, three different stories um, related to the topic of today's show, in this case, assessment. And only one of these stories is actually true as provided. As somebody discussed earlier, there are certainly pieces of truth probably throughout all of these, but only one of these is the truth that was actually reasonably recently in the news. So um, with that said, why don't we go ahead and, uh, and start with our uh, – with our um, – uh, with our uh, – you. Uh, sorry about that. Let's go ahead and start with uh, You Can't Handle the Truth. We're going to uh, start with Brian Rick, who's going to be reading um, Assessment for All. And keep in mind, listen closely, because you're going to vote as to which one you think is the truth um, after this segment. So uh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead and read that for us. All right. Well, teachers in Louisiana are concerned with a new system that will test student knowledge, but not any students preschool students. The new assessment program, Teaching Standards Gold, is part of an accountability system to evaluate all publicly funded early childhood centers. Here's how it works. Teachers evaluate and document if their students are able to accomplish certain developmental skills called checkpoints. These checkpoints will help determine if students are reaching the goals appropriate for their age. Teacher Sean Tolliver told us during a meeting at Williams Charter School there's such a broad set of indicators for the first checkpoint. We're eight weeks in, and I'm only just getting them to stop crying for mom. Preschool teachers are concerned not only with the pressure the assessments will put on children, but how they will effectively measure students with the new tool. Rochelle Wilcox, director of the Wilcox Academy, said her teachers just finished training in the new assessment. We have 39 days before our first checkpoint, 64 objectives that need to be met, that means 32 observations a day, Wilcox said. The initiative's lead comments that the program would not take effect for a few years before using it as a grading system for preschools, but many question if they've taken assessments too far. So much. That was well read. Thank you for that, Brian. And uh, assessments for all is that one, and uh, I guess now we know what comes after prenatal assessments. So, um <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> let's go. Let's go to our next, um, and this is actually the Helene, um, who's going to be telling us about a test by any other name. Okay. Well, some while some educators shun testing, at least one has fully embraced assessment, taking it to the extreme. Susan Kramer hated having to interrupt her fifth grade students' learning for them to take tests on a regular schedule multiple times during the school year. After three years of that torture, she finally decided to embrace the pain. It is kind of a sad joke to suggest that some educators teach to the test. Well, I teach with the test. For Ms. Kramer's 28 students, every, every day is a test. In fact, her instructional strategy is simply a string of tests, one after another punctuated by her students exploring what they need to answer on the test. No longer do her students ask if something will be on the test, since they are exploring the content to answer those questions. Sometimes the cart before the horse is better than the other way around, states Ms. Kramer, 
While I want my students to learn for the love of learning, it was hard to motivate them. Most kids' parents ask that their child do well on the test, and in the case of my class, they do that every day. One student said, I was kind of scared when I heard that we would only be taking tests in Ms. Kramer's class and wanted to change teachers, but now all my friends wish they had her. Ms. Kramer explains that in the past, her students were afraid to be tested, and this way they no longer worry about the unknown. When the first round of testing took place last year, it was like any other day for her kids. Thank you so much for reading that, Lee. And uh, that is a test by any other name. Um, and uh, talk about embracing uh, uh, the, the thing you might hate the most. So I think that's an interesting strategy. And last, we're going to turn to the third rumor. And the third rumor is being read by Kathy, of course. You probably figured out by deduction. Um, and this one is, um, do the assessment shift. Kathy. Have you ever written a test? If you have, you know how difficult it can be. Just like preparing to teach a particular topic hones your knowledge, so too does creating a test to assess student understanding of that topic. Now, some educators just don't want to keep that opportunity to themselves and are sharing with their students. The science department at Richter High in Indiana decided that in support of creating self-learners, they would no longer give students tests they produce, but instead let students create the tests themselves. Science Department Chair, Mr. Richter, no relations to the school's namesake, shared that we had to step back and think about how we as educators produce tests and then teach our students how to do so in a way that they are not simply testing recall. He shares that while it was a slow start, now halfway through the school year, their students are really engaged in developing tests and it has helped them focus science processes and content in a way he never saw in previous classes. This strategy has really caused a problem for teachers in other content areas. One language arts teacher says, my students used to just take the test and maybe question an item or two when they got it back with their grade. Now, nearly every one of my students takes me to task for my tests, even though some of them are straight from the book. Mr. Richter playfully remarked, some people can't seem to handle change. Thank you so much for that. And I think, again, an interesting strategy by, uh, by a, uh, a department. Um, probably one of the only ways you can try to implement that. So uh, um, thank you very much for that. So keep in mind, uh, think about those three, um, those three different stories. We have, uh, again, assessments for all. We have a test by any other name and do the assessment shift. And uh, our, uh, our presentation queen has just opened uh, the um, polling. So go ahead and select uh, which one you think is the truth. That'll be open for um, eight minutes. So get that done now. Um, and what we're gonna do at this point, and we'll come back to that later, and we'll have a discussion about it and, and see what people voted for. So right now we're gonna go into the, the core topic and we're gonna talk about um, about this whole issue about assessment, and not just how do we assess just to associate the score, but how do we assess that we can actually create action both on the part of the teacher and the student. So who wants to jump in? Okay, I'm going to call on people now. <laughs> Kathy! Okay, great. Thanks, Michael. I always try to wait just a minute and see if somebody else wants to jump in. I think that one of the things that we have to consider as we want to make data actionable for people is that each group of stakeholders already makes decisions about and with data. You know, they may say that they have too much, too little, or the wrong kind, that they're going to try and figure it out, that they're going to do the minimum that's required, or it's too hard and too much work. So we want to look at ways that we can be about go about being intentional in helping people to use the data to make a difference. Not only students using it as learners, but adults and teachers using it to change their instruction. I think there's three things that we could do on a daily basis to make data more actionable. One of them is to make it easy to obtain, the second one is easy to understand, and the third one is easy to apply. Perfect. Ryan? You certainly are feet on the street around a lot of this. How does that resonate? That rings really true. One of the one of the elements that um, is essential to this is that involvement of 
students with this same information that, that teachers have. And um, it's just that uh, it's, it's so easy to, for us to um, focus on what's easily measured and you know, less on what has educational value for the teachers and for the students. And that, um, the, that path where we are um, working on um, bringing the, the students into this, so it, it is a, making it easy to obtain and easy to use. The, what I'm thinking about is the, the student's role in this. And um, I think that uh, it, I, I was thinking about when you mentioned being a banana slug at UC Santa Cruz, I think another element to that besides the teacher's narrative, the instructor's narrative, I believe also um, at, at Santa Cruz and other colleges, the students also provide um, evaluation or narrative comments back to the instructor about what worked for them and, and how, or how it worked or how it didn't work for them, that sort of, that sort of input. And so I think that this that actionable data for the students as well is is critical in this, and it's it's one of the hardest parts for us to to figure out how to do with a uh, with a larger system and not when we're not really part of the classroom and don't know what's going on right in their heads. Right, right. Uh, I I think that you know uh, being open and really thinking about what assessment is is really critical here. You know if if you see assess, assessment as judging, um, then you take it personally as opposed to taking it as constructive, actionable information, and that can happen at all levels. And I think so often our system prepares us to think of it as, as, uh, as, as a grading, not as a, not as a, as a way to inform learning. Um, Helene, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, I think um, assessment needs to be more integrated into the overall teaching and learning process, um, and, it, it, and the, the data needs to be immediate and actionable, so I completely agree with my colleagues about that. Um, I particularly like the comments about student engagement and students evaluating their own learning, so acknowledging what they do and don't know and uh, coming up with strategies um, to move forward with their own learning. So, you know, empowering the students um, instead of them being in a reactive mode to be proactive about their own learning process. Um, but certainly, um, you know, thinking about assessment and the future of assessment, you know, making this an engaging and motivating experience for students um, to the point where hopefully someday it'll become a seamless part of the learning process. Um, and I'll jump on that, but I do want to remind people you have three more minutes to vote on the uh, on the uh, uh, you can't handle the truth. Um, and feel free to ask questions uh, via the discussion on WebEx, or you can go ahead and tweet us at uh, at hash sign uh, hashtag ettjan. Um, so uh, just looking at um, uh, Helene, what you just said, I and mean, I'm trying to decide if I should ask this a question or make a statement. I mean, I think so often um, we don't prepare kids to think about how do I act based on assessment. They take it as a, as again, a judgment of, of you know, whether they did well or not. Is, is there, is there a process? I was open this to all of you. Is there a process of successive improvement, um, and and is that part of the culture? So, Michael, this is Kathy. I'd like to jump in and, and talk about yeah, that for please. a minute. You mentioned early in your conversation about the impact of assessment on how we teach, and Brian talked about, you know, bringing students into using the data, which led into Helene's comment, and your question here is, is about formative assessment. It's about how we take that data that we get minute to minute and day by day and teach students well, we have to teach teachers too, but teach students how to use their data to help them know what the next steps are, help them know where to go with their learning so that it becomes, it can, it can be about the content or it can be about their learning tactics. So mm -hmm. either way, I think that there's a, a lot of small incremental steps that we can use with students to help get them more engaged in this process. My friend Kathy Morgan used to say that, Test was no longer a four-letter word in her class, but it became a way for students to show what they knew. And so I thought that was mm -hmm. really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm it's, certain that Peyton Manning was uh, 
was not relying on coaches for for all the input that he had throughout the game. I think he is pretty fully engaged and well motivated. Um, you know, a huge salary might help with that too. But but he he wanted that win, and I'm sure that he wasn't relying on others to tell him if he was what he was doing was working or not. I'm sure he was fully engaged. And and just to build on that engagement thing, I, as I mentioned in my introduction. You know, how do we make this a motivating and fun experience for students? It doesn't, you know, testing doesn't have to be that bad word. You know, it, it just could be a fun and engaging experience. They can, it can be challenging to the student. Um, in some ways, you can make it competitive. Um, you know, it's the same kind of experiences that they have at home um, with, their, with their gaming devices. You know, why can't we bring some of that same kind of fun and engaging experience into the classroom? So do, do you, any of you see that happen in places? Can you give me, uh, you share with people any examples of, of where that's happening successfully? Well, I think that one of the uh, small things that can, can uh, help with that is that, um, that students, it, it needs to, the, uh, their assessment of their learning can't be a, a one and done sort of thing. You know, when, when students are willing to uh, sit down with the, Game Boy or something like that, they get all sorts of lives and they get to, they, they don't take one a shot at it and if it's done, it's done and then they're, and then they're moving on to the next game. So with this, with the assessment process, not only do the students have to be, uh, be a, be a part of that and engage in that, but when they, when their learning is assessed, if they don't have it to the level that they're comfortable and the teacher's comfortable and parents are comfortable for their, for the next step, they, that they get to continue to learn. And continue to assess again, and so that that element of uh, the, it's the it's a summit of it. It's a to me, it's a the challenge is moving from the formative assessment process to places where you say, okay, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and mark this point here at this benchmark. How how are you doing? Do you have it now to the level that you're ready for the next step? And if they don't, it can't be the end of their the, their life on this lesson. They need to they need opportunities to continue to play again. So Brian, I w I'm curious, how do you see that playing out in some of the classrooms in your district? Well, it is a it is a challenge, um, in part because it takes a, it takes effort and it, and it has it requires um, change in behaviors from the from the teachers and from the students. But um, one of the so one of the things is just allowing students to continue to assess and knowing that they're ready when they're ready to be um, to, to uh, demonstrate that they know what they are uh, should be able to do uh, and if they go when they go through that and if they don't if it doesn't meet their criteria for success that they get a chance to to engage again do more learning get more assistance and and assess again it happens in the just in the course of the lesson and with the discourse with, between the students and the teachers, but also when it comes to um, at the end of a, a bit of a unit of time where they might do a end of unit or maybe a secondary students do um, at the end of a end of a semester even um, when they do the assessment if they haven't met their satisfaction or if they haven't met the criteria that says that they're ready to go on, they, they get a chance to, to take the test again. And they, they don't, it's not just I'm going to try again and see if I get luckier this time, but they have to get back into the learning, you know, go work with the teacher, make sure that they um, have been through um, their first demonstration to see where their skills, uh, strengths, and weaknesses are, and then make those adjustments. One of the things that's really helpful is when the assessments are known, like, um, to the students before, you know, the first day of class, I would give the students the final to show them this is this is what you're going to be able to do at the end of our time together. And when students do an assessment, they need to take their scored work, if a, more of a summative assessment, they need to take their scored work with home with them, pull it apart, figure it out, and make the adjustments just like they do with the teacher on the more formative process within the classroom on a shorter cycle. Right. I just have one point to add, and, and that's um, the student's kind of self-evaluation of their own performance. So when a student gets their feedback, um, you know, we, we've worked with, uh, with school districts um, in Louisiana, for example. Um, when students get their feedback on the formative assessment, 
they're able to um, review, you know, their, their responses and whether they were correct or incorrect. But in addition, they get to be able to know whether they actually knew the answer or whether they guessed. And I think that's a really important distinction um, for the teacher because if the teacher is just looking at results and assuming that if all the students or a majority of the students were correct on a particular question that they knew it. You know, there's, there's, there's a gap there because some of the students just happen to guess correctly. Um, so having that additional piece of information from the student, you know, and hopefully they're being honest about it, um, <laughs> just that I guessed or I knew the answer or I just made a, a simple mistake. Uh, but I really did know the answer, and giving them an opportunity to retry that question. I mean, I think that's really valuable feedback for the teacher. I mean, they can make adjustments to their, their teaching strategies based on having that information. But so, doesn't this all kind of assume that t learning is not something that is done to the learner, but in fact that the learner is an actively engaged individual in that process, that they own that? One of the things that a, a, a real easy strategy is when, when a, if it's a written assessment is returned to students after, um, after, after it's been marked by the, by the teacher, um, what's really nice is to leave the final evaluation off of it, you know, no letter grade, no percentage, just returning back to the students, these are the things I asked you to do, and then these are my marks on, on which ones you were able to do and which ones you weren't because when they see a letter or they see a 50% at the top or something like that, they're not going to look, it's just so mm -hmm. hard to look past that. And it, it becomes, they feel like, you know, it feels more like a judgment and there's some finality there. And, they're, and they're, they are less willing to dig in and see, okay, what worked well for me and what didn't. So Michael, what I'm, I'm gonna extrapolate just a little bit from what Helene and Brian said. What I'm hearing is that Helene, Helene thought that the data needs to be immediate and actionable, and Brian says that they need this feedback so that they can use it to move their learning forward. And then Helene talked about the self-evaluation coupled with their feedback and being able to use it immediately, immediately. So I think that the fact that we want immediate data, but we also want the students to have the opportunity to use it immediately to change how they're learning, what they're learning, improve, et cetera, is really key to making the data actionable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, if you look at uh, video game producers, they spend a considerable amount of time designing environments that provide immediate actionable feedback. Um, and it's, it's, it's certainly not something that we've really figured out how to do in education. It hasn't been a goal. Particularly, I'm going to I'm going to leave us on that thought. We are getting some questions from some of the listeners. Um, I do want to, however, first turn to um, taking a look at one of the ways that we reimburse our participants in the show in in the Education Table Talk um, is by we don't give them money. Uh, we give them a hearty thank you and a shake and a pat on the back, but we also let them choose a project um, being done by a teacher somewhere potentially in the world, but certainly in the U.S. Um, and we will donate on their behalf $50 to that project. So um, I just want to go through and, and have each one of you tell us something about um, which project you selected. Um, and uh, we'll then join back in and talk a little bit about representation um, of data. Um, I do want to thank again MCH for their sponsorship of the program and again for their support in um, providing the funds for the donor choose uh, 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 donation. So let's go ahead and go first. Um, Helene, why don't we start with you and tell us a little bit about the donors choose that you selected. And again, it's on the screen and others should be able to go out and look at that if they want to. Um, sure, so um, I selected the technology in the classroom and this is, um, this is a charity supporting uh, Ms. Peters' class for grades PK2 at the International School of Monterey. Um, so it's a well-regarded K-8 charter school um, that selects students by a lottery system. Um, I've selected this charity for a couple of reasons. One is um, it is 
our company is based in Monterey, so it's, it's kind of a local, um, well-regarded and respected school. In fact, some of our employees have students at that school. So um, certainly secondarily, we're you know, strong supporters of technology and education. So we wanted to support you know, a local charity that wanted to use mobile technology and give students an opportunity to have access to that technology in the school. Thank you so much, Aline. Nice. I mean, again, I always want thoughtful selection. So um, uh, I know they thank you for that as well. Kathy, let's turn to you. Calculators for all students. Well, I picked this one kind of for some of the same reasons that Helene did. It's local. It's a school that I've visited. There are teachers there that I've worked with in the past at um, the Mapleton Expeditionary School. And having been in Brian's role as a district assessment coordinator, I know what a difference it makes if you don't have to share calculators. So having enough calculators for all the students to do all the work or when they take an assessment is really important. And trying to schedule sharing of those types of uh, resources can be a real challenge, particularly when you're working on assessments. So this is a good project. I'm friends with several people in the district office, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to help them out. That's great. That's super. Thanks, Kathy. And last, Brian, Clickers for Success. Yes, actually, my first choice was for a project at the at a middle school that my my daughter goes to, and we had the happy news of that project being ended up being fully funded. So I went on to Clickers for Success, uh, Mrs. Sable's classroom at Franklinton Primary School in a high poverty area in Louisiana. She would like to have a personal response system for her students, the Clickers, that will allow students to every student, no one can hide, to engage in what is happening, empower, empowers them and gives that in the moment data for the teacher so she can use that formatively to make adjustments on the fly. It looks like a great project. Well, that's great. And, and great selection by all three of you. It's always nice and uh, the reality of uh, supporting what's taking place in those classrooms. So I think actually it's a really good bridge, uh, uh, Brian, from your selection to this issue about representation of information and data. How do we, um, you know, I mean, if you're using clickers, and I've seen them used well, and I've also seen them used really poorly, um, how are you providing feedback? How are you changing that experience that it really is a formative experience, and how do you represent the information in a thoughtful way? And then I'm going to go to a question, actually. We have two questions from some of the listeners that relate to this as well. So anybody want to jump in there? Representing data in a way that it's accessible. <clears throat> and we know we can do qualitative. I, I, I'll, I'll add a comment there. Um, okay. So in terms of, in terms of data, um, my, I, I see the value in data in not just, you know, a set of numbers, but, but really um, constructive feedback mm -hmm. that will both inform um, the user of that data, but also answer the, you know, what do I do next question. So um, not only providing information about what you can and can't do, but then providing you with guidance as to uh, how to improve in the areas um, where you may not be as strong, but also uh, providing challenges for those, you know, high-performing students so they can continue to learn beyond, um, you know, what, what, where, they've, where they've been measured. Helene, I really appreciate you talking about the descriptive kind of feedback that moves learning forward. I'm also struck by the thought that you mentioned going beyond just uh, representing data with numbers, because I think of Edward Tufte's work around visually vibrant data displays. So how can we represent data in a way that perhaps doesn't have any numbers in it? You know, I'm thinking about the back of USA Today when they have the weather map with colors, and I don't even really need to read the numbers to get a big, quick picture of what's going on in the United States and what's going on in the area where I am. So how might we consider different types of data displays? And and I, you, I was just going to toss in there too, based on uh, uh, from what you said too, um, that it's the the data representing growth for all students. So not just did I hit um, did I hit a benchmark, but doing some goal setting, 
representing what that looks like, and then for every student that they uh, at those marks in time that they have a point where they say, yeah, I hit my goal, and now what's my next goal, and they can see that growth or lack of growth, and not just ha I hit a status, I've met a standard, and I'm done. Every every child needs to be challenged, and representing that sometimes it, it's easy to fall back on on numbers, but I I like what you said to add to that, Kathy, about different representations that are that are quick and visual that gives me a quick snapshot. I almost have a feeling when I look at it and I know what to do next. Thanks, Brian. So, I appreciate that. Is it happening anywhere? Have you seen anything that's particularly useful that addresses that issue? So for well, me, think, uh, because – go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. No, no, please, Kathy, go ahead. I was just going to say, for me, because I travel around the United States and I see lots of different schools, there's one common feature that I see frequently is the use of a data wall. So whether it's a data wall in a classroom where students are kind of looking at where they are or whether it's a data wall in the teacher's lounge or the teacher workroom where they're looking at where students are in relationship. You know, the use of color is really important and it gives you that quick picture so you might walk in and see red cards, yellow cards, and green cards. And whether it's the students doing it or the teachers doing it, it really helps get them to see those steps in progress that Brian was just talking about and how they're growing either as a group of students or as individual students. I was just going to toss in there, too. I think it's important as the students, as soon as the students can, that they're involved in those representations as well. Um, students tracking their own progress as they're monitoring their, their, their progress over time in their log books, on the wall, but the, the students doing the, doing the recording as well. Um, and then, of course, the fun thing, when they get a little older, you can throw a little map in there and, uh, <laughs> and sneak in some, uh, some additional learning without them knowing it. Let, let me uh, pose two questions, and I think they're really related. Um, one is, you know, um, you know, as related to student engagement as well as the topic we've been discussing about the assessment, what about, you know, how do we engage kids with metacognitive strategies as part of that formative assessment? Um, how do we, uh, how do we, are we explicit about that? Do we model it for them? Um, what, what are the ways that we actually help them understand that? And then the last one is how do we do that um, with group and collaborative exercises, that certainly becomes a whole other level of challenge. Um, I'm glad that that was brought up because um, I'm I'm thinking about um, again going kind of going back to gaming. Um, a, a, a couple of things I know um, I know because I've played games myself, but you always want to get to the next level. There's always that challenge of of of, of surpassing a level or gaining a badge or some kind of uh, Marker that says I've achieved, um, you know, and I'm I'm at this at this next phase. Um, so if we took kind of a page from kind of the gaming book and applied it over to a formative assessment environment, you know, why not give students that same level of engagement and the same level of uh, motivation to achieve? And you know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, it could be just a little marker. And then you know, bringing in that kind of the social component. Um, of learning, you know, having students engaging with each other, um, having them working together collaboratively to, uh, you know, to achieve greater learning. So, Michael, for me, that metacognition in formative assessment is a huge piece because we are teaching students to think about what their learning target is, where they are in relationship to that learning target, and what are the next steps to get there. So that's critical thinking and problem solving, which are keys to, to metacognition, but they're also keys to helping people be successful in Common Core classrooms. Yeah, that's, that is right on. And the, 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 one of the challenges is it kind of slows things down. And for mm -hmm. me, it's kind of you have to slow down to go fast. And what uh, it was difficult um, in, in times in the classrooms where the students would no, perhaps I asked the question and they had the right answer and they didn't know how they got the answer. Um, and they be, would become increasingly frustrated with me because um, I would say, well, I, I knew the answer too. In fact, I've got a whole book full of answers. So actually, I, I'm really less interested in the answer, but I want to know how you got there. And 
that that process of modeling for them and walking them, stepping them back and walking them through what they thought as they as they constructed their response takes time. And it's and it's some students need some slow down strategy through that. Some teachers have a hard time with the pacing and making the time for that, but it is definitely worthwhile. Uh, great insight in terms of the, the reality of, of making that happen. What I want to do is actually go to um, a slide a little bit further down. We're, we're beginning, it's always, I don't want to slow down these conversations. So we were just talking about different strategies, um, and I, I just thought maybe um, this was something that uh, Kathy shared with us, um, looking at five best practices for improving, and I thought it was nice that it included teacher and student learning. Um, you know, I uh, years ago gave a presentation called Supporting Both Learners in the Classroom, regardless of the side of the desk they're on. Um, and so um, why don't we, I mean, if, I think we've already talked about the use of formative assessment. Maybe, um, you know, strategies for promoting student engagement. Um, and then I, I think this third one is one I particularly want to look at a little bit closer, beg, bother, um, and steal time. Um, to collaborate with peers at the structured and focused learning community. Why is that important? Oh, Michael, that one's so important. I know. <laughs> you, you have to give teachers the opportunity to share their practice, to give and get feedback, to reflect and learn more. And it doesn't really matter what the topic is, but right now we're talking about actionable data. So if I go back to those three things I said originally about making data easy to obtain, understand, and apply, this time is really important to give teachers the opportunity to understand and then figure out those next steps. And oh, by the way, it translates to the students too, but if the teachers have this time for collaboration, then their administration is supporting this work. They're creating a space for the learning to happen for this collaboration time. And oh, just to add uh, to that, I, 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 I think that Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, just to add to that, I think the, the collaboration um, with the teachers is, is critically important as well. And I, I think it also offers um, the teachers an opportunity to share best practices with each other. I mean, how, how did you implement this in your classroom? And what did you do in this particular situation? I just think, you know, that, that kind of interaction is so critically important. And, you know, Brian, I just want to hear your perspective on this, because I know that, um, you know, beg, borrowing, and stealing time in order to, uh, you know, does it come out of instructional time? Where do the funds come from to support teachers if it is outside of that? I mean, is this a challenge that you encounter, particularly around, you know, assessment? It, it definitely is a, a huge challenge. Um, but we have so much evidence that, that it, that it's worth the while. One of the elements to it that I think is critical for for teachers is it, it makes our our practice more public. And if some you know every now and again you um, we will perhaps we have in our in our background experience with uh, being students of teachers or instructors who um, stopped learning years ago, and it's really evident in the experience in the classroom and with finding. And it is some, it's begging and borrowing, and sometimes it's it's the the goodwill and the volunteerism on teachers' parts to just make that time together, where they can be learners together, share what they're doing, make it public within their within their community, and and just because they they know that they want to improve and they know that they can't do it alone, and puts them back in that learner mode. It's it's critical. It's huge, and um, it's just it's a, it's a difficult thing to. Uh, to find the funds for because um, the funds are driven by kids and kids in the seats, and uh, it's easier it's easier to fund new standards. It's easier to fund new tests. It's easier to fund new measures and new accountability. It's really difficult uh, at the national and state level and the local level to come up with funding for professional development. And I was I was just at a PTSA meeting last night. I suppose they were involved, even though I don't have a, a child in the system still. And uh, one of the parents uh, said very very clearly that the biggest predictor in, that he's seen, and he had several children who've gone through school, 
but the quality of the teacher, not necessarily the quality of the materials, although all of that's important, but it's really the quality of the teacher's preparedness for the teacher to be able to help um, at least his kids um, through that process. I want to just quickly go to some questions to consider, um, and I, we're not going to actually have time to address these. Um, and uh, but I think they're important points of reflection. You know, how do we make assessment something that we aren't doing to teachers but with teachers? I think that so often, um, you know, they're handed an assessment, they're meant to carry it out, and then they go on with their lives. Um, another is that, you know, every professional needs support, and that includes teachers, as we said. You know, how are the teachers using formative assessment, and how do the administrators support them in that process? There's a, a certain amount of professionalism and, uh, uh, and support for teachers as professionals. Um, lastly, you know, from earlier days, it seems that teachers are interested in formative assessment, and administrators are concerned about summative assessment. This is some of the data we didn't actually share on the program, but that Kathy had shared with us. Um, how do we get administrators interested and engaged in formative assessment? It's, it's often not the place where they're held accountable, and yet they, they often are the ones who make time and, uh, to make that happen. Again, obviously, these were all topics that we could discuss on today's show, but maybe for another one. I do want to, um, any, any very quick concluding thoughts um, from all three of you? I'm just excited about the opportunities um, that are that um, technology brings to uh, assessment in general, but in, in particular to formative assessment. I think it uh, allows for a more engaging experience for students and allows for a different level of feedback, both for the student and, and for the teacher. Great. Kathy? I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm excited about the fact that we're talking about providing data that's accurate, meaningful for all the stakeholders, and supports learning, both for the students and for the teachers. And last but not least, Brian. Well, this is, this is a great topic, and it is, it is exciting to think about what it, what it can be and what it, the direction that we're moving toward. Um, and it, there's this balance or tension between accumulating data for accountability versus data for improvement. And uh, I think the topic today, there's so much to, to talk about in the area of expanding and working on getting actionable data for the people who are going to make something happen, the learner and the instructor. Uh, there's just a whole lot of work that can be done there, and it's really exciting. Great. Well, uh, again, I really appreciate all three of you. We're going we're gonna to come back uh, again in the uh, and uh, talk to us a little bit more. But let's go to the next uh, section. We're just going to talk about some of the upcoming conferences. Most of the listeners um, that we have are people who are involved in the industry, and uh, it's always good to know what's coming up, particularly topics around um, uh, conferences around the topic that we're discussing today. So, um, one of the things that's coming up January 28th is the ASCD Institute. Um, who is going to speak to that? Oh, I can speak to that, Michael. I am actually Please, going. Yeah. I have a couple of Doug Fisher's books on my bookcase, and he is the one that's leading this institute. And as we've talked today, you know, formative assessment is really important. I think personally it's going to be one of the biggest pedagogical changes that teachers can make to help meet the demand of the Common Core State Standards. So I'm really excited to learn. Perfect. Um, if you look for Kathy there, um, TCEA. Um, has grown and grown and grown. This has sort of been the trend in the industry, so that's the Texas Secure Educators Association um, conference. At one time it was, you know, FETC, and uh, we've had different regional conferences. TCEA is really the place to be, and uh, um, a lot of good uh, uh, vendors there, a lot of good discussions with educators, and a lot of good leadership happening. Um, the next is the Technology-Enabled Personalized Learning Summit. Now, there's a mouthful. Um, by invitation, but I, I, we know the right people, so um, uh, I think a lot of you have probably been invited to that. If you haven't, certainly look for the outcomes from that. It's really going to be it's held at the Friday Institute, and um, it's really going to be looking at all the different aspects of personalized learning and how technology can support that taking place. As we all know, one of the biggest conversations, of course, is what is personalized, and there's so many different definitions for that, so I know that's going to be um, addressed. Um, uh, the last one is the ATC Innovations and Testing Conference um, in Scottsdale. Who's going to talk to that one? Um, hi, it's Helene. So the Association Great, of Helene. Tech 
Um, it, the Association of Test Publishers meeting is a meeting of, of uh, organizations within the testing and assessment industry. So it's a great way to get to know um, all the organizations that provide assessments um, or assessment tools and capabilities, and it's a great way to network. Sounds like a great conference. I'm sure a number of you would be interested. Keep in mind, Scottsdale, Arizona, for those of you who are dealing with negative 40 degrees in Michigan or something of that sort, you probably will need that break. But uh, it, it's it's uh, it, it's actually a good reason to be there um, because of the content. So thank you so much for that. Now we're going to wrap back to um, You Can't Handle the Truth. And uh, before we share the results, um, I want to hear what the three of you think. Brian, Helene, Kathy, which one do you think is the truth? Well, I'm going to ring in first uh, because uh, as interesting as all three were, I'm going to go with the assessment, do the assessment shift as my as the truth uh, because it kind of rings true to uh, some of the nutty practices I was doing in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brian, I'm going to have to piggyback, and I can, I'm can i piggybacking on that one because I've actually seen it happen in a school, so I agree with number three. I'm going, to, I'm going to beg to differ, and I'm going to say that I think the first one is the truth. I mean, sadly, I think the first one is the truth. <laughs> So let's go ahead um, and open up uh, the results, and let's take a look at this. Uh, do we have any numbers in there? Apparently not, um, but uh, hopefully that will come up at some point. Um, uh, I know that people have voted, but uh, let me just go ahead and tell you as we're going to run out of time here. But in fact, the truth is assessment for all. You got it. Nice job, Helene. <laughs> um, you're right. Unfortunately, um, uh, that was actually the one truth. And actually, I'll, I will tell you, there are certainly pieces pieces of truth, as I said up front, in the in the other two. Um, and it's always fun to think about it. The goal here is, to, of course, Let's let's think out of the box. Think about the kinds of things that could happen. So, um, as you said, it's sad but true. And uh, imagine trying to do 32 observations a day on preschoolers. I'm sure that that's what they need most for their education, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for participating in that. And. Um, I, I just do want to thank uh, MCH Strategic Data for all of their support for this effort. We're going to ask our guests one last question before we round things up, and uh, that question is going to be, what would you tell a publisher who is designing a new instructional application um, to do um, to both embrace formative assessment while supporting high-stakes assessment? Before we hear their response, I do want to again thank MCH um, strategic data for all their support. Uh, Jackie, thank you, and, and John for your support, and all the staff over there um, for Education Tabletop. Our uh, next show is going to be on February 19th at the same time, um, February 19th, and we're, we're calling this one Betting on One-to-One -one Odds, um, Will One Tablet Solve Our Education Headaches? Uh, and I know we have two confirmed guests for right now. One, um, if you've ever heard his fellow, um, uh, it should be a lot of fun, and that's Elliot Soloway from University of Michigan. Um, and we also have Eileen Lento um, from Intel, uh, who are both uh, just wonderful people. We're still trying to confirm our third person for the call. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and go to our question here is, what would you tell um, a publisher who is wants to uh, embrace formative assessment but also will need to support high stakes assessment? Kathy? So, Michael, I would say that think about innovation. You know, Helene's brought it up a lot today. How can we activate the students more as a learner? Many apps are designed for teachers. What about the students? What about the ability to self-assess on their learning targets, set their goals, track their progress, see who else in the class might be a resource on a particular learning target? I think that kind of app would be really useful. Perfect. Helene. I just I have to piggyback on that. I just um, am very excited about the opportunities to really fully engage the student 
So I would really ask um, publishers to emphasize that level of engagement, making it motivating and exciting for students and providing them with meaning, meaningful feedback so they can take charge of their own learning. And Brian, you get the last word here. Well, we tell our teachers to go for the learning standards, teach, just let the tests and accountability fall where they may. So for publishers, I'd say go for the in-the-moment measures that inform teachers and students. Sit in some classrooms, see how it works, and then just let the administration fall where they may. <laughs> I like that, Brian. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for your insights throughout the show. Uh, again, thank you to our guests, Brian Rick, Colleen Dugan, and uh, Kathy Dyer. Uh, thanks you to all of you for joining us at the table, um, Ed Table Talk. And again, we'll talk to you on February 19th. This will be recorded. You can pick it up off of the MCH webpage. Thank you so much for all being here. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michael. Bye, Thank Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye.